Hey everyone, I'm Francesca Maxime, and welcome to this edition of the Rerooted podcast here on Ram Dass's Be Here Now Network. So thrilled to have you join us for this episode where we're going to be talking about um, healing-centered care, really. Um, we're t- going to be talking about um, going beyond sort of the, the nomenclature of uh, trauma-informed um, to something a little beyond that. And the person who uh, I really feel put this on the map is my guest today, Dr. Sean Ginwright. He is the author of Hope and Healing in Urban Education, How Urban Activists and Teachers Are Reclaiming Matters of the Heart. And he's also the author of other books as well. Uh, a leading national expert on African-American youth, youth activism and youth development, an associate professor of education in the Africana Studies Department and senior research associate for the uh, Cesar Chavez Institute for Public Policy at San Francisco State University. In 1989, he founded Leadership Excellence, an innovative youth development agency in Oakland, California that trains African-American youth to address pressing social and community problems and also created the Research Collaborative on Youth Activism, a network of scholar activists who study, advocate, and support youth organizing efforts all around the country, and the co-founder of Flourish Agenda, I could go on, but I'd rather just talk to (laughs) you. Welcome, uh, Sean. Thanks so much for being here. Great. Thank you for having me, Francesca. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So I really was turned on to you by the article that you wrote in Medium. Uh, I think it was published a few months ago. Um, And it was the shift in talking about something that a lot of people talk about, trauma-informed, trauma-informed, to something that shifted to healing-centered. Can you talk about that maybe at a fundamental level, if that's an okay place to start? Sure. Sure. Yeah. You know, I think, um, you know, my, my own work for years has been working with young people who come and who come from and live and, and play and grow up in really difficult environments and um, very challenging neighborhoods. And my work um, has really, you know, as I was trained, um, as an educator and then as a sociologist um, and really um, was only trained to identify the kind of problems and challenges in these neighborhoods and communities, but not much about what to do about it. And so um, I've been really struggling and trying to um, really have a deeper understanding of not only about the conditions and the issues that young people were bringing to me in my own community work, um, working with young people, but but more interested in the the conditions that produce the trauma, uh, that produce the issues. And so, um, you know, about four years ago, I was in some uh, a healing circle with these young men that I that I wrote about, and they they really they really pushed me about, um, and they didn't say it this way, but they really wanted me to center the conversation on their full humanity, as opposed to a piece of what happened to them. And when I, when they, when they pushed me, I really took it seriously. And that is, how do I embrace and how do I begin to think and how do I uh, act in ways that see these young men not as problems to be solved or not as um, treatment targets, but really full human beings that deserve to be saturated with an opportunity to live their full human potential. And so that is what prompted me to really do some thinking and and soul searching about, well, what does it mean to um, provide uh, young men with an opportunity to, um, to be fully human, even in the context of their trauma? And so that's where I began to sort of write um, about this, this concept around healing-centered engagement and really um, shifting the nomenclature from trauma-informed care to healing-centered engagement, which is not just a naming process, but a paradigm shift in thinking about ways to have a holistic, loving, humanistic approach to people who experience trauma. Beautiful, and specifically to communities of color and young men and anyone who experiences color. I mean, anyone who experiences trauma, but especially in these communities that you're talking about. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Um, and I misspoke earlier. Um, It's healing-centered engagement, and I love that because it is 
um, right there uh, the dignity um, and the wisdom from the person uh, coming forward in that by engaging as opposed to care, which is nice, but almost implies like a, you know, they talk about the difference between pity and empathy and compassion, uh, you know, and sort of compassion is like inaction that I'm feeling your your pain and, you know, engaging with you about it, which is, I think, what you're talking about as opposed to just, I feel bad for you or yeah. you know, I feel bad with you. Yeah, care, you know, which is important. I don't, I don't say, I don't think we should abandon trauma-informed care, but it, it's just an incomplete um, process. And so when we say care, it presumes that care is a form of treatment um, and it addresses the symptom of a broader issue and when we talk about healing-centered um, engagement, it requires us to ask, one, well, what does it mean to heal? What does it mean to be, be well? Um, what does it mean to, um, what does it mean to engage, right? So those terms, I hope, provoke people to think differently about the human connection that's required in, in, in a healing process, and not only think about treating the symptom of issues that result from exposure to trauma. Yeah, beautiful. So maybe talk to me a little bit more about what that looks like. An example, you were talking about being in this healing circle. Um, how does that actually work? Well, I mean, I think the first is an awareness uh, of the root causes of trauma in the first place, right? So, so there's different types of trauma, right? There's trauma from natural disasters, there's trauma from war, um, the trauma that I'm particularly talking about, however, uh, unique to the United States is violence uh, and trauma in neighborhoods where largely young people live and work and, and, and grow up. And uh, that form of trauma, I think, um, uh, even though they share symptoms with trauma from natural disasters and domestic violence and, um, and war, um, it is a different, it's a different nature. And so... What I, what I try to, I think it's important is first uh, for people to really have a broader and a, and a deeper understanding of, of what are the root causes of trauma in the first place. And so it's important to understand disinvestment in communities. It's important to understand the poverty. It's, a, it's, diff, it's important to understand um, uh, the quality of schools, the broader socio-ecological process um, that creates difficult life conditions for folk. Um, and, and without an understanding of the broader condition in neighborhoods, then we, again, we shift to symptomatic treatment as opposed to addressing. So the first is this awareness, right? Well, what is the, what is the community like? What are the conditions that you grow up in? Um, and then the second is really, um, is, is, um, forms of action that allow for young people to understand those conditions. So for example, in my work, um, one of the things we do is we have worked with young people who grow up in very poor neighborhoods, and we want them to understand that poverty is not just something that is a result of bad decisions and bad behavior from their parents or from their friends, that poverty is systemic. And so we, we ask them, for example, um, to identify all the banks in their neighborhood, then identify all the grocery stores, and we tour, we walk them around to, to their own neighborhoods, and then we have them describe the quality of the housing, talk about the park, what, what, what's in the park, and then we get them in a van, and then we drive them out to the suburbs, and a very wealthy suburb is about 45 minutes from here, and we ask them to identify the same thing. How many banks do you see? How many... Um, grocery stores, what are the quality of the parks, and talk about the quality of the homes, and their stark contrast. And so when we come back, we ask them to talk about why, why there's such a dramatic difference between their neighborhoods. But that physical, that sort of um, ex deep experiential comparison of quality of neighborhoods prompts them to ask deeper questions about how that came to be. And then we provide them with answers about the political decisions, about political investments, about how neighborhoods came to be in a particular way so that they begin to develop a political understanding of their condition. That's the second thing. We engage them in a political understanding. And then the third is really about not only focusing on the worst thing that happened, but also focusing on their dreams. 
And this is an important process because the research suggests that when people have future goal orientation and when they can see themselves in the future, that that becomes a healing process. It's because you're not stuck in the same reality. And so we actually have opportunities for them to talk about their dreams, the things that they want to do, the things that they want to be, and, that that, and not only focusing on the worst thing that happened to them. And while that's an important part of the healing process to acknowledge what happened, we don't stop there. We have them do dream boards. Talk about what your life will look like in 10 years and have ongoing conversations about that. And then we provide them with, with opportunities to actually pursue those dreams. So if they want to open up a store, if they want to open up, um, you know, a, 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 a music studio, right? We try to get them um, examples of that. So the part of healing center engagement suggests that, yes, trauma happens. We need to address the acute conditions and symptoms of trauma, but it doesn't stop there. And the, hum the more humanistic way approach is to provide an opportunity for people to, for young people to understand the political issues that are in their neighborhoods, for them to, um, uh, for them to um, engage in some form of political awareness, and then also fostering the ability for them to dream and have future goal orientation. Yeah, I love that. I love that three pronged approach because it's so, um, it's so important and it's so non, it's so inclusive of the totality of the experience and the complex complexity of the experience and the layers of the experience. Yeah. And it's, and it's, a, it, you know, I say that this is non-clinical, right? It's not a clinical treatment. Um, and, and it allows for the young people's spirit to be present um, in the process. And we know that that young people and that the healing process is not just a transactional relationship. Um, a tr it has to be a transformative relationship. And that transformative relationship is one where young people's spirits are present and that the adults that are in the room, that their spirits are present and their exchange of humanity, their exchange of, of, of vulnerability, their exchange of compassion creates the kind of healing that's necessary to support them through that process. And that's a very different thing than um, clinical treatment. Um, what we're suggesting is that, that in order to provide that kind of healing, it's significant and important for the adults to be deeply engaged in that process as well. I'm, 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 I have to close this door because there is a vacuum cleaner. That's all right. I'm just going to... And if you hear... Some and so, as you were saying, we just had a little um, a little break. Um, that that really, it's about non clinical approaches. It's 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 sort of what we talk about in the mindfulness um, world. I think. And what's your direct experience? I mean, the Buddha said, "Ehi pasiko, come and see for yourself." When you're taking those kids to these different experiences into one and one neighborhood to another neighborhood, they're experiencing what that difference is like. They know in their body. Um, what it feels like and what they're noticing and what they're taking in, in a way that, um, you know, you could read it in a book, but it wouldn't be the same. And so that ownership then becomes their embodied wisdom and it marries with their own wisdom, as you say, of their hopes and dreams, as well as um, whatever uh, history of trauma um, that they've had, sort yeah. of locally, if you will. Yeah, we, you know, we live in a society, a society that, 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 that doesn't promote opportunities for ongoing deep reflection and, and for young people to experience um, these contrasted neighborhoods. And this is just one activity, but it really fosters the ability to, it, to, to do and practice ongoing deep reflection. And so one of the things that is important in this process is that um, we, we also believe that this healing process is, is, a, is a, as I was saying, is a transformative relationship. But the journey of deep reflection, the journey of me talking about my own story in growing up in a similar neighborhood as them, my own reflections about my life, my own trauma, my own all that stuff is just as nutritious for their own healing 
as the journey itself. I so love this because we know that in um, certain modes of clinical work, um, the opposite is true. And uh, a psycho psychologist uh, who founded a, uh, a trauma modality um, had said that they had said, I, I, I had not said this, but that they had said that uh, psychoanalysis can be damaging. Um, you know, it, it's not even not corrective in some ways, but in, in their view, that it would be damaging um, by not enabling the person who is the quote unquote therapist to show up as a full embodied, relational, non-transactional uh, human being with, um, frankly, a bit of skin in the game, I think, as you're talking about in this collective universe that we're all really a part of uh, and, and connected yeah. to. Um, and so... I love that you are emphasizing that. Uh, and, and I really think that even in my own work, I've seen that that's part of what is so beautiful about what is transformative, as you say, and not transactional about healing relationships. Because half the time, the really amazing teachers and healers, if you will, that I know are the ones who say, yeah, well, the kids healed me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, it, and it presumes that, you know, just because you're an adult that you're not, that you're finished, right? And, and we're not finished, right? We are still deeply in our own human journey and, and growth and learning and development and, and, our, and the ability for us to sit with our own stuff and share that actually contributes to our own sense of well-being. And so we can't think about healing as a one-way street, right? That I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the physician, I'm the therapist, and I'm going to heal you. But healing is a relationship. It's a two-way street that, that my well-being and healing is contingent upon your journey. And we're in this together. And so that process in some ways goes against some of the conventional ways that we think about, um, you know, tr uh, uh, addressing trauma. And, uh, you know, in my view and in the research, we know that these, these practices are, are, are really critically important. I love that. And, and you, you know, you keep emphasizing the relationship. There's so much to unpack here that I want to get to. Um, Dr. Joy DeGruy, I know, talks about how the, the sort of worldview of, um, you know, African-Americans, pe people of color, indigenous people even, um, beyond to sort of continue to have a wider frame around relationship and not the individual or hierarchical, you know, kind of more Eurocentric um, model. And that, that that would make sense, right? And 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 uh, coming back into presence around not having relationships be transactional, but to have them be in fact relational and to be intimate in that way implies that there's going to need to be a certain amount of vulnerability, which you're talking about with your own experience. And if you don't mind sharing a little bit about that, I would be curious to know um, a little bit more about your own personal history and how when you show up in that way as someone who is authentic um, with your own history and then um, where you've come and, and how, what you've been able to manifest with, I'm sure, help along the way and yeah. I'm sure continued support, how that then is helpful um, for them and for you. Yeah, yeah. No, my, my own background um, into this, this work, uh, you know, I grew up um, outside of Los Angeles, outside in Southern California, in a very, you know, working class, um, um, two two uh, parent household, uh, two brothers. Um, my uh, neighborhood that I grew up grew up in um, turned violent, and um, my parents decided to try to get me and my brothers out of that neighborhood. Um, and as a result of it's violence. I was exposed at an early age to all of the kinds, not the same kind of violence that we see now. <laughs> you know, folks didn't have guns back then, <laughs> but there were there were there were you know pretty traumatic ex you know experiences seeing people um, you know getting beat up and 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 all sorts of violence. And so we we were able to move to another part of town, but I experienced another type of trauma, and that was uh, a type of trauma where it was primarily white community. And that trauma was about my own shame about my own racial identity. And that trauma was uh, going to, you know, an African-American young man going to a predominantly white school. Um, I began to be traumatized about shame, uh, about the way that I talk, about 
uh, insecurity about what I know. Um, and that stuck with me. Um, and um, that process um, really wasn't resolved until I was, I was um, fortunate enough to have a number of mentors that said, hey, you know, there's this thing called college. You might want to think about going to college. And I got into some programs and they sent me down to, um, you know, uh, 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 San Diego State University where I was saturated with African-American studies courses and African-American, other African-American students who were on their own journey about identity. And it was at that time that I met a group of, of, of college students that said, that we shared the same kind of story. We grew up in the same neighborhood. We had this sort of racial shame and we knew a lot of other young people in, the, in San Diego were probably having the same experience. And so we, we decided to try something unconventional. And we said, we want to have a summer camp for black kids in San Diego. We don't know how we're gonna do it. We don't have any money, um, but somehow, some way we pulled off um, a camp for six days on the campus of the university where we brought 50 teenage kids. And we didn't know there was, this is Francesca, this was before youth development. This was before yeah. any of the theories. We didn't know any of that. We were just some college kids that said, hey, we think we can do something good for these kids. And they came and uh, I'll never forget, this was at the same time, I think it was in 1989 when the, the um, you remember the the, um, the the riots in Los Angeles with the Rodney King? I think this was in 89, maybe 88. But there were kids from Los Angeles who had come down, who had participated in, the, in, the, in that. They had burned buildings. They had, and so we had an opportunity for them to share about why they did that. And the kids in, L, in, in San Diego didn't understand why they did that. But what happened is, is that they began to talk about their lives they began to talk about everything that was happening in their lives. And we were not therapists, Francesca. All we did, I remember, you know, sort of like, if you build it, they will come. Well, you were human. And, yeah, and so they talked and they shared, and we knew that, that by building this camp, by building these opportunities, that we're creating something um, very important that's missing in the kind of ecosystem of young people, particularly African-American young people. And so we did that and we, we've continued to do that every year. And every time we've done that, it's changed me, it's informed my own research, it's in built on my own sense of humanity. And now we're trying to take lessons from that every year and um, spread it around the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I hope this can be a small um, piece of that, you know, spreading, if you will. Um, that's beautiful. And, and I love how you all came together. And, and you, you mentioned this idea of, you know, racial shame and, and all this stuff, like the way I talk or, you know, being displaced quite literally, like having to, for reasons of safety, right? You're like your parents wanted you to live yeah. <laughs> and be okay. <laughs> and with that, of course, you know, there's a whole bunch of other stuff to unpack and to process and, and that's continuously um, ongoing, I'm sure, at, at, at certain levels, um, but that you're in this place where you're able to connect with these young people authentically. And I would wonder how you, you mentioned reflective practices, contemplative practices, you know, that kind of thing. I don't know if you have a, a spiritual practice or anything that centers you or keeps your nervous system, you know, regulated so that you can be present and open with people. Um, but I think that might be valuable for, for some folks that are in these positions of either clinical or teaching or, you know, whether it's a classroom or whether it's a therapy office or a school counselor or whatever, that oftentimes the emphasis is on the behavior. And then I'm not so sure that everyone themselves is so regulated because oftentimes they're burnt out or whatnot. Yeah. Focusing on yeah. Behavior. How does that work? That's a whole nother show, right? <laughs> Which is, you know, the lack of, contemplative space and opportunities for the adults who are working with young people, particularly in schools. Um, and teachers, uh, principals, educational leaders simply do not have the space to sit and reflect and, and breathe and focus and be centered. So um, that's another show. But, but my, my own practice is, yeah, I mean, I think um, a couple of things. One, I have a personal practice where 
Um, I meditate. Uh, I'm not a good medit. You know, I don't meditate that long, right? And so I would just put that out there. Like, you know, some people say they meditate an hour. I don't, I can't. I just, I just haven't yet built that practice. So I, I try to sit uh, for about 15 minutes. Um, about seven of those minutes are chatter. Um, and then the next, you know, eight minutes, I might be able to actually be present. And, and then I, I start my day. Um, I usually then go and do some form of exercise. I swim. Um, I'm an avid swimmer. That's a form of breathing that I've found very useful for, me, for both exercise and contemplative practice. Um, one of the things that I do, I haven't really shared a lot with folks, is that once I'm done swimming, it's at a park. And it's the distance between the pool and the car is a good, you know, two or 300 yards. I take my shoes off. And I try to just focus on the experience of my feet on the grass Beautiful. and what that feels like. And I, I walk slowly, deliberately, and just really try to experience the wetness of the grass, the softness of the soil. Um, sometimes when the sun is out, when you move from the shade to the sun, the temperature of the grass changes dramatically. So I try to I try to experience that when I swim every day and then I'm in my car and then I come home and then I go to work. Yep. <laughs> um, but that's, that's one of the practices I try to do during the day. Um, I don't ha you know, I don't have um, a, a deliberate practice except for with in our staff meetings, we begin our staff meetings with some form of, of sharing of some form of being present. And then we go into the business of, of what we do. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. So beautiful. And sounds like you've had, um, you know, I don't know, maybe you just did it on your own. But I know that when they talk about, um, you know, mindful walking and, and walking practice and the retreats that I've been on at um, the Insight Meditation Center and other places, that that is very much um, sort of the, the instruction, if you will. It's just notice, just notice what's here now. I just yeah. You know the way the grass feels the difference in the temperature any sense or smells and just you know just sort of be there and the fact that you're just integrating it into your morning routine um, is just really a beautiful invitation for other people to just say well okay maybe I'll go up the stairs and maybe I'll take off my shoes and I'll notice what the pads of my feet feel like when they're walking up the stairs not the same as being in the grass directly but not so different either yeah. So it's, you know, it, it's training the mind to just notice that. So I, I love that. Yeah. Um, thank you. So as we're moving into the space of how do folks then who, you know, you said, you know, creating space for people like principles and everything like that to be contemplative and reflective is something that needs to be done. And that's great. But do you have anything for words of advice for folks who are in the hot seat and they're focused on the behavioral piece. Is there any takeaway where they could say, well, the more regulated you are, the easier it'll be for you to get into that relationship that you're talking about where there's juiciness and maybe some vulnerability from you that's being asked for the kids to kind of come forward. If you're looking for a shift in behavior, God forbid, this might be a way to do it. Yeah. And, and you know, I remember, Francesca, I remember having a conversation with some teachers about behavior of their young people and, and, and how they need to heal and how they can integrate healing into the classroom. And one of the teachers stopped me and said, yeah, Dr. Jen, right? But what do you do when a kid picks up the desk and is getting ready to throw it at you? We can't just say, well, you need healing at that point, right? And I, I'll never forget that because... Um, I didn't really have much to say until the next time we met because it shook me. Um, but what I came back to say to that teacher is I would have been curious about what is the relationship you had with that kid prior to him picking up the desk? Because my sense is, is that one, if perhaps if there is a transformative relationship, perhaps the desk would have never been picked up. And two, if you have a transformative relationship, the way your humanity shows up to ask them to look in the student's eyes and to say, I need you to, you know, I need you to take a deep breath right now, that that spirit exchange, that relationship could have resolved or could have possibly 
um, address that in a different way. So I don't know because, um, you know, it's kind of a, as a reflection. But my, my, my takeaways are, or my lessons are that one, we have to invest, we have to invest some time early on to prevent the kind of behavior problems that will ultimately show up, right? And so if you don't invest in those relationships, the, the challenges, the behavior challenges are gonna show up. If you invest in those, kind of, in those relationships, your ability to resolve and navigate those relationships, those behaviors are, are gonna be quantumly, are, are quantumly more effective than if you don't invest in those relationships. We, you know, schools and community-based organizations sometimes, um, well, particularly schools, are so, you know, they're so regulated about time. They're, you've got one class and then, and it's the ability to foster those relationships becomes very difficult. I remember we sent my daughter to a private school for, for two years and I couldn't understand why the first two weeks of school, the kids were, first week they went camping and the second week they were just playing on the, doing stuff. But I realized that for that school, they were like, we know it's important to build the transformative relationships with the students and with the faculty so that they can go on their learning journey together. So that's an important lesson that I think is important mm. that folks should be thinking about. Invest that time now um, or it will become very difficult later. Yep, and devil's advocate, well, I don't want to invest that time now. When I look deeply into my students' eyes, when I actually like behold them, what reflects back is an inner me that's wounded or that's sad or that's angry or that's confused. And I don't know how to hold that. I feel uncomfortable with that and I can't really hold that. Now what? Yeah, and, and that that is a function of your own healing journey, right? That, that, that your, un, your inability to be comfortable in sitting with that means that that's, that's your own healing journey. And so that's okay to be clear about that. I think that, that an acknowledgement of that is one, it's an important healing process is to, is to first say, hey, you know, this thing happened to me when I was 14 years old and I see it in this 14 year old and I sense, and I don't want to deal with that. Okay, great. That's a great acknowledgement. Okay. Now, how can you begin to deal with that? Who are you talking to? What are you thinking about? But to spend some time actually acknowledging the thing that happened, working through your feelings. And, you know, there's this practice, um, Francesca, that I think, you know, is something that I learned is that, um, is that it's, you know, I think it's a, it's important to begin to learn how to separate our thoughts and feelings and observe them, right? Where we are able to say, I've, to, to sit and be curious about the things, the thoughts, the emotions that come up develop a sense of curiosity around that. Well, why am I feeling, hmm, that's interesting. That's an interesting emotion there. Why is Sean feeling this way? Hmm, is it because he feels insecure? Oh, that's insecurity. What, hmm, that insecurity, oh, it comes from when your mom said this about you're not good and, oh, that's okay, so that's the, so that, that level of observ curious observation of emotions and thoughts deep curiosity about that allows for one to acknowledge, kind of wrestle with it and then release it. Right? Yeah. But if we are believe, if we're, if our thoughts and feelings are us, then we don't have the observational curiosity to wrestle through it. Now that is easy, easier said than done. And that's why we call it a practice. Yeah, no, you're preaching to the choir here, but I love how you're explaining it. I love it. Yeah, yeah. So that's something that I um, practice and those of us and those of folks that we train to work with young people at a certain point, because everybody's, you know, that takes time to actually have people understand that, that, that distinction between curious observation and and of thoughts and emotions and being thoughts and emotions. So we, we do that, but it takes time and it is a practice and it's, and it's a practice for me as well. I'm not perfect. And so that's something that 
um, I aspire to do and that I wrestle with and that I try to, I, I try to use. Well, I love how you're explaining it because it's, it's sort of what I like to call applied mindfulness, just like you did with the walk between the swimming center and your car. It's applied mindfulness. It's not just some sitting on a cushion at a retreat center only kind of thing. This is how it shows up in real life. And this is where it's useful in real life. Yeah. Right? It's not meant to be compartmentalized. I mean, as a practice, just like you do push-ups or just like you do laps or just like you do whatever, as a consequence, you get stronger mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, but it's not just for the strength training. It's for, you know, it's not just for the physical benefit because the knee's connected to the thigh bone. I mean, they're all, you know, one influences the other. And I love what you said about um, the idea that, you know, we're not, we're not just our thoughts. And, and I was just explaining this to someone the other day, like, you know, can we be with them? Can they sit next to us? This is, you know, can we be with the part of us that's hijacked right now that that is you know younger or more overwhelmed or in any way um, reactive and can we um, have some curiosity as you said calm curiosity and perhaps even compassion about how they get to be that way or what were they thinking yeah 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 in terms of the part and and i and to apply this full circle back to the the neighborhood i mean some of the folks that i work with um in east new york some of the young people um court involved you know african-american um you know, they do have this, all the things you're talking about, living in neighborhoods, you know, that are, can be violent or systemic poverty and, and all of that. And the reactivity, the way the nervous system, the way that the, you know, the story and the beliefs attached to, am I not good enough because I was in foster care? Or am I a disappointment to so-and-so, my father or whatever, because I was incarcerated or, and then reclaiming that, inner dignity that we are talking about, like I'm future oriented, like where do I really want to be? Um, holding all of that, but that when the thoughts get clogged, I said, it's like if you're in your tracksuit and your tracksuit was in the washing machine and it's soaking wet and then you put it, you have it on and like, it's all of you right now. So you yeah. think that you're soaking wet and that you're just the wetness and this, you know, nasty moldy wet tracksuit. It's not, you could take it off and you could put it in a pile right next to you. Yeah. separate from that. And those are all those thoughts and feelings that you can get curious about. I love that. Yeah. It's just, I mean, cause you know, you got to work with what you got, right? Like what's yeah. the metaphor that works? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So talk to me a little more maybe about the future oriented stuff. Cause a lot of these kids talk about, I want to be an actor or I want to be a, 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 a rap artist or um, you're a, a, a PhD. And there's different kinds of ways of, um, being, you know, finding your place in the world yeah. in terms, and I'm just wondering, um, yeah, how do you work with kids? Yeah, um, I got two things um, I want to say. I wanted to respond to something a little bit earlier that I'll answer that mm -hmm. question. Um, part of the challenge with talking about healing-centered work and contemplation and contemplative practices is that sometimes people believe that the answers then rely on rely our, our ability to be curious about our thoughts and emotions. And that's the solution. In other words, that, that we can, as long as we have awareness of our thoughts and emotions, then you're free. And, and I don't want people to rest on that solution because there still are structural issues in our society yes. that create suffering in people's lives. Patriarchy, racism, poverty, homophobia, all of those Preach. issues still create suffering. And so, and so I, don't, I don't want people to hear this and go, oh, you know, if we just meditate our way through freedom, no. that somehow the world will be better. And, I, and I, in fact, you know, I'm very critical of some folks that, that rely too much without, without the structural analysis and rely so much on sort of the contemplative journey um, without an analysis of the lives and the conditions that people are living in. So yes. for me, the contemplative journey is a way to build power to confront and transform the structural issues that are in our society. Yes. And so we have to build the capacity of individuals and communities, but that capacity, that inner journey, 
is only a tool to confront and transform the outer structural reality. Yes, thank you. All yes. Of those things together create the kind of meaningful life that that we were that we were put here to 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 to, to journey towards. So I just wanted to say that because and I'm I so glad folks, you did. I don't want folks to to leave with with that analysis that Jen Wright is saying that we can meditate our way out of oppression. <laughs> no, it's a tool. That's what I always say. It's the whole point is you can't really be in a choiceful place or in a place of non-ignorance um, unless you are able to uh, get curious, um, which means that you have an awareness of what's actually happening. And yeah. so, you know, the contemplative practices, those moments to reflect the pause and all of that, I don't want to say they're a means to an end, but they're certainly like, okay, I can be with this. I can hold this. I can get curious about this, whatever it is. And then I can go forward and be empowered. Like you said, you know, like they say about the thing powered by blah, blah, blah on the advertisements, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm powered by my meditation to then go doing the policy work and the structural work and then absolutely. showing up work. So I appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. Dreaming. Um, the most, probably one of the most powerful, um, strategies, practices needed to transform our society. Um, without the capacity to dream, we only engage in remedial social change. My wife always says that if the Africans who were enslaved didn't dream of freedom, they would have just wanted a more just or easier form of slavery but it was a dream of freedom that allowed for people to fight the Underground Railroad, the Civil Rights Movement, that it was a dream that moved people to a place of possibility. And so um, I was doing a workshop in Detroit a few weeks ago and we we're talking about dreaming and why it's important. And it's one of the, the, the people in the audience, they said, yeah, but what if these, you know, some of my kids, they just, they dream about playing basketball, being a rapper. What do you say about that? And I say, and, um, and it, was, it was directed to me as if there are legitimate dreams and then there are illegitimate dreams. And shouldn't we have them focus on the realistic dreams, which is an oxymoron, <laughs> right? And so I responded, who am I to have the right to tell somebody what they should be dreaming about? The dream is not about achieving it. It is about who you become in the journey towards it. Mm -hmm. So, but without the dream, you don't, in, you don't engage in the journey towards it. And so, yes, it and once you achieve it, then you come up with another dream. But the dream is not about achieving it. It's about the journey towards it. And so um, what I shared with that person is that no matter what the dream is, it doesn't matter as long as that person sees themselves in the future and is on a pathway to becoming that. Because who they are in that journey is not who they are when they came up with that dream. And if they, if once they meet that dream, they're not gonna be the same person and they know that it wasn't the dream that they met. If they, got the, if they had the dream one day and got the thing the next day, that's not, that's not really a dream then. That's, a, you know, that's goal setting or something, right? Right. So, um, so I encourage people, both adults and young people, to dream and not just set goals. And dreaming means is that I saturate my thoughts about what might be impossible. That I take seriously uh, the, 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 the notion of impossibility. That is, you know, what can we, what, you know, we are, as a species, we are perhaps one of the few species that have the gift to see that thing that does not yet exist. And that if we don't nurture our ability to do that, we're not then living our full human lives, our full humanity. And so dreaming for me is deeply important, not only just as a personal practice, but a critical ingredient for social change. Yeah, I love all that you said, um, dreaming versus goals. And also um, it just makes me think of, um, you know, the whole, mindfulness teaching of, you know, we're not attaching to outcome. Um, you know, one of the things is we're orienting the compass of our heart toward something. 
it might be toward forgiveness. It might be toward we're dreaming of forgiveness, maybe, or part of us, or it might be toward achievement. It might be toward whatever it is, but that we're orienting the compass of our heart and then walking the path as you do from the swimming center to the car toward something and that that becomes the practice and that that is the experience moment to moment and that you're transformed through that um, however long it is um, mm. as opposed to um, being stuck. And I know we don't have a ton of time, maybe five minutes, maybe less, three uh, Yeah, I'm looking at four, four <laughs> minutes. Trying. Four right. minutes. Where does joy fit in? Joy. Joy. Yeah, that's a great question. Joy. Um, and, the distinct, and the distinction between joy and happiness, right? Um, and I, I'll give you a quick, a quick um, scenario. So we became deeply curious about the role of joy and happiness in the work for justice and healing. And we believe that only, th only and when I say we, we have a team that works with young people and, and adults. And we didn't know, like, how do you foster that, right? How do you, how do you actually do joy, right? We're not, this is not, we're not a church, and how do you do joy? And then we began to talk about, well, you know what? When we were kids, we experienced joy when we rode bikes and we played in the sand and we built sand castles and we, we played, you know, we were kids because we played. And so what if we actually use play as, a, as an ingredient as a, as a strategy, as a practice to foster and cultivate joy, right? So part of, so we tried this with some educators, adult educators that are working with kids in, the, in difficult neighborhoods. And we said, this was a retreat we went on. And we're, we said, this retreat, we're not gonna learn about trauma. We're not gonna talk about trauma. We're not gonna talk about healing. We're gonna actually play the whole weekend. And they loved it. And, what, and then we talked about why we're doing it. We played with Lincoln Logs. We played with Lego Logs. We played with, bubbles we played with all kinds of things and we talked about what it felt like to imagine and to kind of um experience a sense of mo being in the moment right so um so i think joy is is again um one of those ingredients that sometimes we underestimate in our own sort of work for justice and healing um, happiness um, is, I try to separate this notion of joy and happiness, right? For me, joy is a more um, experience that comes from within, and happiness may be more moment by moment. It's external. I'm happy when I receive, uh, when I win the lottery, right? I'm happy about that. Um, but, but the joy from that winning the lottery is that I'm able to take care of my family, that I'm able to um, create something that I believe that I was put on earth to do. So there is a relationship between joy and happiness, but they're not always the same thing. I could use my happiness from the lottery to achieve joy, but the, the lottery doesn't give me joy, it gives me happiness that I can then use in other ways. Does that make sense? Yeah, I get it. And I know time is short. The bottom line is, is that um, I think that when you talk about the play, which is something that I've done with people also, clients and stuff, you have the joy um, emanating from uh, within. And it brings in that curiosity and that sense of possibility that we otherwise um, can forget that is still accessible to us when we're walking around in these adult bodies. Dr. Sean Jinwright, Hope and Healing in Urban Education, How Urban Activists and Teachers Are Reclaiming Matters of the Heart, is the latest book. Um, there are others, and I'll also share your website. Is there anything else you'd like to say before you go? Just uh, thank you, Francesca, and I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to share these ideas. And I very much appreciate the work that you're doing, and I hope that more people can find you and be inspired by what you're doing. So take good care. All right. Thanks so much.